All right, it's four o'clock. It's time for lightning talks again. Thank you. Thank you. How was the rest of EuroPython for you today? Was it good? All right, all right, thanks. I think all, all the people with the green shirts, everybody who's putting work into this, really appreciate that you like it. Okay, let's get started. Um, we don't have two setups again. Um, we're going to stick with uh, a, a quick switch over. So if you are giving a lightning talk today, please be prepared to quickly set up. Um, we're going to start with Anton Turin about elliptics. And the person after that is going to be Austin Bingham on being super. Austin, are you there? Excellent. Best position you could pick. All right, let's go. Hello, my name is Anton. I work at Yandex. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Yandex is a Russian company. We provide services uh, like uh, searching and, uh, oh, something wrong, uh, search, mail, uh, video, music, and so on. We have a lot of user-generated content services. And uh, today I would like to introduce you one of our uh, open source projects uh, named Elliptics. Uh, Elliptics is a distributed, fault-tolerant, key-value storage with high availability, high scalability, and a lot of other buzzwords. Uh, we, we use it uh, in our production to store uh, petabytes of data and billions of keys, and it works perfectly. Uh, it was founded to solve problem uh, when one of our data centers uh, goes down. Uh, idea of Amazon Dynamo uh, is uh, in base of this storage. Of course, uh, Elliptics uh, has uh, DHT and provides replication. Uh, by using mechanism of uh, elliptics groups. Uh, each node in one group uh, takes responsibility for some range, uh, bless you, uh, uh, for some range of keys and this uh, DHT ring, and uh, when you store your data um, by key, hash is calculated from this key, and uh, according to that number, data is transferred for some node. If you need replication, uh, you should write your data in three different groups, for example, in three different data centers. Elliptics is not simply a storage. Uh, it provides a distributed cache, uh, Russian words uh, imagine, uh, and uh, we use it in our, for example, uh, content delivery network. We use this uh, cache, uh, for example, in Nginx. Uh, we use this uh, cache in services which are related with some um, uh, operations with sending files, for example, photos. Uh, if uh, some photo becomes very popular, we could uh, copy this uh, photo to the cache and uh, closer to the user, so we could save a lot of I.O. and network. Uh, the other feature is that Elliptics uh, provides you a, an ability to um, start your own program on the same node uh, when your data is stored. It's server-side scripting. You uh, could write your own program on Python, C++, and many other programs, uh, languages, sorry, and uh, uh, you have a guarantee that you, uh, that your worker would launch on the proper node and you need not copy any data through network. Elliptics is easy to use and easy to enlarge. Uh, it has a rich and powerful Python API. Uh, it supports asynchronous operations, so you could implement a really good scalable applications using it. Uh, of course, we provide C++ and Go API. And uh, we have, of course, HTTP interface for our storage. Uh, it has buckets and keys like uh, S3. S3 interface, sorry, and uh, it's not compatible, but um, full S3 compatible interface is being developed now. It, 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's quite obvious uh, that uh, it's impossible to store uh, billions of keys on uh, ordinary file system, for example, on X and X3 and so on. So we implemented our own backend for elliptic storage. Uh, it named eBlob. Uh, at the first glance, uh, it looks like a simple large binary object and you just append that data to the end of this file and marked uh, deleted keys as deleted. But uh, there is a lot of rocket science in this uh, part of elliptics and it's extremely fast. So the bottom line is uh, if you need uh, distributed storage in your own project and you could not rely on S3 because of uh, Big Brother or something like this, uh, I think uh, I'm pretty sure that Elliptics is a good choice for you. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Hopefully this just works. So okay. the next one is Austin on being super, and uh, Mikko Atama is the uh, the next one. Mikko, are you there? Okay. If it works, that is the big. I can't yeah. see you, Mikko. There we go. Okay. There you are. Thank you. Great. Um, hi, my name is Austin Bingham. I work for and and part own a small uh, software company in Norway called Sixty North, and I want to talk about well on being super. So, who here uses super? Just raise your hand. So nearly everybody. That that sounds about right. Who knows how super actually works? Much smaller hand. Who knows about the super proxy objects and method resolution order and the C3 algorithm? Okay, all right, so basically a lot of us use super um, but don't really understand exactly what's going on inside of it. And that's the position I was in a couple months ago when I had to develop some training for somebody and, and I wanted to know how does super work. I used it for literally more than 10 years knowing that super is how I access the base class implementation. That was my model of it. I'd never had to really get any fancier than that. Um, but as I looked into it, I, I learned that actually super is really fascinating and it opens a door to a wide variety of really interesting design choices. And so I thought it would be a great topic for something like a five minute lightning talk format. So here I am. Um, so the first thing you need to understand to understand uh, super is method resolution order, which a lot of you probably know already because you, you can use or you use method resolution order all the time implicitly even without super. All it is is an ordering of an inheritance graph. And so here I've created uh, A, B, C, and D, a standard diamond, uh, well maybe not standard, maybe not a good idea, but it's a diamond inheritance graph. And you can see the MRO for D in the end there is D, B, C, A, and object because of course object is always in there. So it's just an order that Python has come up with for all of the classes in an inheritance graph. Um, as I said, this is useful, this is used for all method resolutions. So you call d.foo, uh, then the method resolution order is used by Python to figure out which of these objects, which of these classes, I'm sorry, implements foo. And the first one that has foo is the one that gets used. That's fundamentally what MRO is. So how is MRO calculated? It can't just be randomly chosen, it must have some order. That's what the C3 algorithm is, or C3 linearization is the computer science-y term. This came out of uh, the Dylan language, I think, I don't know, many, many years ago, and now it's used in Python, Perl, Dylan, um, probably some other languages. It's very popular for dynamic um, MRO calculation. It has three basic things that it guarantees when it calculates the MRO. One is that derived classes will come in the MRO before their base classes. So it guarantees that. It guarantees that whatever base class order you give in your class definition is also preserved. So the relative ordering is always preserved um, based on what you tell it lexically. And finally, the first two constraints are, cons are conserved anywhere in an inheritance graph. So the relative ordering of classes is always the same no matter where you start. These are the rules that C3 provides and that's how Python resolves functions, uh, methods I should say. C3 brings with it a little bit of baggage. One of the interesting side effects is that not all inheritance graphs are legal. So in this case, you see I've created another inheritance graph where D inherits from B, A, and C in that order. And because of the guarantees that C3 wants to make or is going to make, it's telling you it can't do that. It can't have A before C because A has to come after C because A is a... Um, is that a bell I should be concerned about? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on here. Really, I don't. Um, so you can, get it, you can get yourself into a hole. You may have seen this, maybe not. I'd never seen it, but I thought it was interesting. So that's C3. So finally, we come to super. What is super actually doing? And this is the, the most pithy, terse explanation I can come up with um, that's not a poem, which may have been a good idea. But given a method resolution order, some MRO, calculated by C3, and a class C in that MRO somewhere, super gives you an object which will resolve function, resolve method calls using everything after C in that MRO. That is the definition of what super does. 
Does it make sense? Yeah, you read it a few times later if you want. When you call super, what you're actually doing is, is creating a proxy object, a super proxy, and that's the workhorse of super. That's the thing that in, embeds all this logic about looking in the MRO in the right place and using the tail and so forth. So I had this nice picture of not really horses, it's a horse and a donkey. But one of them is named Mr. Sir Henry, which I thought was a cool name for a donkey, so I put it up there. They're the workhorses of super. Um, Super proxies are, like I said, just regular objects. You can take a reference to it, you can interrogate its type, and you can see that it has a little dunder thing in it called this class, which is the, the class type you passed as the first argument. So you can uh, examine super a little bit and get a better sense of kind of how it's put together and what it's doing. So in summary, I think I'm well in time here. One, Python calculates an MRO for all classes. You might have known that already. C3 is the algorithm that does that. Super requires an MRO and a starting point in that MRO. That's the how it knows what to trim off of the MRO. And finally, super proxies find the first class in the rest of the MRO that supports the function that you want to call, or you tried to call, and that's how super works. Thank you. The next one after Mikkel will be uh, Dimitri Milajev. I hope I pronounced that arbitrarily wrong. There you are, I can see you, thank you. Also, what somebody might share what the ring was about, is that a nice message or? <laughs> Please, um, turn off your phones, we all will be happy with that. Hello Berlin. So, who is having fun in EuroPython? Please raise your hands. What's that it? Again. Come on again. Very good. My name is Mikko, and when I'm coming from you, are going to have more fun. <laughs> so uh, we are going to have a bike on Finland, and uh, I'm here to tell you why you should come go there. And the first of all, we, can, we are having fun now, so let's compare Finland to Berlin. So, <laughs> first of all, uh, we are a little bit smaller community there, so we are still uh, uh, maturing, so we need a lot of uh, guys to come to see us and to tell us that the Python is good. I'm especially proud of our little PyLadies community which started like one year ago with uh, two members and now we have 60 members there. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, in Finland, it's not the Berlin, so... Uh, <laughs> you can use your laptop for the uh, purpose it was created, which is warming up your laps. Also, a lot of cool technology comes from Finland. <laughs> so, uh, if you like Linux, SSA, or IRC, you should come to uh, pay us a visit. <laughs> Looking for our freedom. <laughs> and we are the only PyCon in the world where we have a sauna party. And uh, I need to uh, tell the truth that I'm not actually one of the organizers. And because I'm not the organizers, I can't make any promises. So if there is no sauna party, you are invited to my home. I have a sauna for three people. <laughs> and uh, what I hope that you would do now that you go to uh, fi.pycon.org, and what we lack in Finland is a good speaker. So we have had the problems to uh, have these foreign superstars uh, come to our conference. So if you have a talk in PyCon, please reuse that talk and come to tell the talk again in the, our PyCon in Finland. <laughs> Thank you. Lynn, are you around? I can see you here next. Okay, right. cool. Ah. Okay, my name is Dmitry Smilaevs. I'm a PhD uh, student at Queen Mary University of London, and I'm doing computational linguistics 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, so this talk will be about distributional semantics. 
Uh, semantics as a study is all about meaning, and because I'm doing languages, so it's meaning of sentences and meaning of words. And uh, like the main ideas of the whole field are, can be said in these two sentences. So you should know a word by the company it keeps, or a little bit more formally, that semantically similar words tend to appear in similar contexts. Um, so if you think about it, then you will see uh, uh, words like beer or wine occurring together with, um, I don't know, bar and parties. And probably such words as Python will uh, occur with some different words, like, right? So, oh sorry, this IPython is a bit confusing. Uh, so, now we can, if we get a, a big text, we can just uh, look to it, and for every word we will look, what are the other words, our word of uh, co-occurs together? So, for the boy, we will know, okay, we, we see it with A one time, and we see it with might one time, and so on and so forth. And then we do it on many other sentences, and do our counting, and we get something like this. So, we got our boy, and we know that it was together with time about 100 times, and together with year about 102 times. And then we do the same with goal, and, we, and what we notice, that these numbers kind of similar-ish, right? At least they're not, uh, the pattern is different than to notion and idea, right? So we, we can measure a way of similarity. So how, how can we do the similarity thing? What, we, what we're going to do, is that we will see these words as vectors in a multidimensional space. And vectors, these are just some directions in, uh, to points. And between two points, you can calculate the distance. Or you can cal calculate the cosine between these two points, right? So that's what we are going to do. Uh, so we'll use scikit-learn uh, and ask us, OK, given these vectors, please calculate us the, uh, the distance, and what we see that indeed, boy is much closer to goal than to notion, and we would expect it. So can we go even further? Can we actually can make it vis uh, visible to us? So uh, now our vectors, they're kind of in, in a so huge multidimensional space that we cannot even imagine how it looks like. Uh, so we, what, what this code is doing, that it's, uh, um, it tries to, to get the same points on a two-dimensional space and tries to preserve the distances. So why, why it's two dimensions? Because then we can easily plot it. So, and if we plot, we get something like this. And so here you see that boy is close to the girl, Mother is close to father, so, and uh, all the family words, they cluster nicely in our field. And then kind of business-related words are here, and colors are there, and so on and so forth. So that's what distributional semantics is about. Though my main message is, is this. Oh, sorry, <laughs> is this. <laughs> so it was really few lines of code, but there were some intuition behind, so some, some science was behind. And uh, if scientists tell you, uh, they kind of know uh, what to do, but developers know how to do things. And if you connect these two th things together, you can achieve very great results. And it doesn't really apply to linguistics, it applies to any science. And I really encourage you to look for some cool scientific results if you're a programmer, or, lo or learn programming if you're a scientist. Thank you. The next uh, after Lynn will be uh, Harut Dagesian. All right. Oh, awesome. My turn. Okay. Hold on. I don't have slide notes, but I can kind of um, make shift. Hold on. Uh, oh, damn it. It's not set up right. <laughs> totally unprepared. Okay. So um, first, a little bit about me. Um, I am Lynn Root. Uh, I actually live in San Francisco. Um, I am a back-end developer for Spotify. 
Um, I am also um, leader slash founder of the Pi Ladies of uh, San Francisco and a board member uh, on the Python Software Foundation. So um, earlier, um, Miko from uh, PyCon Finland talked about um, them having um, Pi Ladies for about a year now, which is pretty awesome. Side note, you should all go to PyCon Finland. I spoke there last time, it was awesome. Um, and you might be wondering what exactly is Pi Ladies? So Pi Ladies is um, sort of a mentorship group for women and friends in the Python slash open source community. We're there to support women and diversity. Um, we've been around since the fall of 2011, and um, Pilates San Francisco started in April 2012, and we're now up to like, I don't know, 1,800 members. And we have about 50 locations um, all around um, the world, except Antarctica, which is kind of the purpose of this talk. Maybe we can get a little Pilates in Antarctica, little penguin Pilates. Um, so, uh, why would you want to start a Pi Ladies? I'm presenting about Pi Ladies, why would you want that? Um, it can be, it essentially is the motivation for you to learn or to better your Python knowledge. Um, I started Pi Ladies by wanting to learn how to code in Python and got some friends with me and it kind of blossomed from there. Um, it also gives you leadership and organization and it creates sort of um, a networking um, kind of web for you so you can kind of you know, find jobs or build your resume. And also, we kind of want to take over the world, so that's kind of awesome. Uh, how can you get PyLadies? Um, you can pip install it. <laughs> um, I did, I created a Python package um, right before PyCon, and it's up on PyPI. Um, so you can go grab it. Um, yeah, there is literally a PyLadies on PyPI. So many people ask me about that. Yes, there's literally, not figuratively, literally a Python package. Um, so pip install PyLadies, and then run PyLadies handbook. And what it does, what it gives you, is it's a handbook and um, a checklist on how to start your own local chapter. And it has some assets and images so you can promote uh, PyLadies. Some workshop materials so you don't have to like create your own workshop. A lot of them are beginner um, workshops. And um, I am still developing it and uh, we'll have more scripts and stuff for like local organizers to work with Twitter and Meetup and um, um, data mining about um, our Meetup statistics. So um, if you don't want to pip install it, you can also go to kit.pyladies.com to see what it's about. Let's just um, read the docs. And um, basically, <laughs> I wanted everyone to uh, be able to have their own PyLadies. Thank you. And the next one would be uh, Radomir Dopieralski. Radomir, are you here? All right, thank you. It's okay? It's, it's, I don't know. Oh. I think there's the screen on there. It should be, I yeah. think it's coming up now. Um, oh, it's, it, it kind of, it's there. So, it's a, okay. If I try, okay. Oh, it's mm, sorry. I think it should be. I can't help with Russian. Cloned. Okay, I just can, move, can you work, move can you work with over there and there say. Do you see that screen over there? There's another screen down there. Maybe you can use that I, for the I thing. just uh, move the uh, presentation there and show this way. OK. Uh, my name is Harut. Uh, I, was, uh, I want to present uh, our forms, uh, like Django or WT forms, but ours. Uh, forms uh, purpose to validate uh, user input uh, uh, convert uh, that input uh, from uh, form representation to uh, Python internal representation, uh, render the forms, and uh, our key feature is uh, that uh, they work well with uh, nested data. 
So we have a little bit different uh, abstraction layers. Uh, uh, the main object is form. It contains a uh, nested structure of fields. Uh, field represents a single atomic, uh, single maybe atomic or maybe a complex uh, structure of data. Every field has a converter, has widget, uh, uh, has permissions, and has uh, data before converting and after converting. So here is the form. To create your own form, you should uh, subclass uh, form class and uh, define a list of fields. Here you can see there are nested fields and uh, uh, to use form, you instantiate it uh, with uh, initial data, uh, then accept, call accept with uh, data you, you want to convert, uh, and either get a data in form that Python data or uh, get errors. Uh, here you see a result of conversion of nested structure. So, uh, converter is an uh, object uh, with uh, two main methods. Uh, one is uh, to Python, which uh, accepts a Unicode string and returns uh, object of type of, of whatever type you want. And the second uh, method uh, does uh, uh, revert. Uh, Re reverse uh, conversion. And you can define uh, validating functions that just uh, validate or, s or do simple one-side uh, conversions. So, uh, and from these uh, methods, uh, you can uh, throw validation error, which, uh, which is written in uh, form uh, dot errors. So, uh, you put converter in the field uh, and validators as uh, arguments to converters. Converters can be required or not required. Um, there is implementation of um, multi-dict um, features that allows us to uh, add values under the same name. Uh, list of converter with uh, with uh, nested converter. Uh, here you see implementation of multiple selects by list of converter. Uh, you can easily mm, t tweak converters uh, by copying them uh, by call. Uh, and uh, here is an example of uh, implementation of a little bit uh, complex converter that uh, converts, oh, not implementation, usage, uh, that converts SQL, uh, that converts uh, uh, dictionary to SQL alchemy object. So widgets uh, are a little bit simpler, they just uh, take a field and render them uh, to the uh, template. You can render the entire form or a uh, single field. And uh, where do we, we use? It is our CMS with some keywords presented. So here it is. Lars Butler, are you there? Is it you? Hello, everybody. My name is Radan Dopiralski. I'm, you know, 
there, there is a saying that Python is going either to save the world or destroy it. And I think there are enough people working on the saving part, so I thought I will work a little bit on the destroying part. Uh, so this is a hobby project of mine. It's a killer robot that's going to <laughs> run around and kill everybody. Uh, it's uh, made with a Raspberry Pi uh, inside and programmed in Python, obviously. Uh, it started as a, actually, as a mechano set uh, thing with, with some Arduino attached to it, but that didn't work too well. So I got a servo controller for it, and it's a programmable ki kind, so I thought, oh, great, I can program it. It came with some uh, language based loosely on Fort. I don't know if you know Fort. Uh, it's, it wasn't as easy to program as I anticipated. Uh, then I decided to upgrade the robot and give it a, another knee, so it, it has three degrees of freedom per leg. And that, thanks to that, I can make it move much smoother and I can make it tilt and, and to do all sorts of cool acrobatics. Uh, but because of that, I had to do something called inverse uh, kinematics, which involves a little bit of math, mostly trigonometrics, and a little bit of linear algebra. And doing that in anything but Python was too painful for me, so I decided to remake it again and, and put a Raspberry Pi inside. And also to put a bigger battery because all these extra servo servos were uh, too much for, for, for the three AA batteries that I had in there. And it's growing, it's still growing. Uh, right now it has a gyro uh, sensor so it can sense when you tilt it or when you pick it up or things, things like that. It has an audio, uh, it has a speaker connected to it, so it can talk, for example, the voices of turrets from Portal. Very useful, like, hello, friend, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and it's coming on nicely. Unfortunately, I was planning on bringing it here and showing how it works, but unfortunately, just before the conference, it, it burned three servos in, in the legs. So I decided, no, I'm not going to risk that. But uh, this is how it look, looked like recently. And that's all. Thank you. Oh, by the way, it's, not me. it's called Kubik, so you can Google that and see it. We are making very good progress. Everybody who's in the overflow slots has a very good chance to actually get the talks in here. Um, Dimitri, Semo, Dimitri Semarov, are you around? Excellent, get ready. Works, hi everybody. So I got to practice this uh, elevator pitch when I was at the OpenStack Summit in Atlanta a few weeks ago. So I've condensed that all for, for you to just a couple bullet points. So here we go. Uh, this is zero VM, and I work for Rackspace, by the way. Um, zero VM is not zero MQ. It's not Docker. I can't tell you how many people ask me, is that like Docker, after I explained it to them in a few sentences, so it's not Docker. Docker's cool, but this is not Docker. Um, it is not a drop-in replacement for any other type of virtual machine. It's something completely different. It's not NACL, but it's based on it. And um, if you want to know about NACL, I'm not going to explain that to you. Just go read about it. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, it's open source, and uh, Rackspace is sponsoring it, but that doesn't mean it's a Rackspace thing. Um, anyone who wants to get involved in it can. Uh, just to give you a quick comparison uh, of different types of virtualization technologies, um, something like KVM would be in the far left column. Um, there's no kernel, there's no operating system, the, the overhead is extremely low, there's no interpretation, uh, it starts up in about five milliseconds. Um, and it's extremely secure. But of course, there are some limitations. Um, a couple other um, key aspects. Um, there's, there's no place to get entropy from. Uh, time and random functions behave completely deterministically. So if you, it's just like a pure function. If you give it x for input, you will always, 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 always get y for outputs, no matter what. Um, and there's no persistent state. So you can't really write a daemon with this thing. It's more of like, a, 
don't think of it so much like a program, but think of it as like a function. Your programs behave like functions, so you, you decompose your application to small, tiny, tiny little programs. Um, so, of course, you need to do something with this. So, uh, for, for I.O., you have to map all of your inputs and outputs beforehand, and we do that through an abstraction, uh, what we call channels. Um, a channel on the host, on the outside of 0VM, can be a file, it can be a pipe, it can be a socket, or whatever. Um, but inside, it's just treated as a file. Everything looks like a file. And you can read and write, and you can declare, okay, read only, or read write, or whatever. Um, like I said, it starts up in five milliseconds, no interpretation. Um, the cool thing about it is that um, this, is, this gets really useful where, when you have an environment where multiple users are running arbitrary code. You don't want them to talk to each other, probably. So um, the worst thing a user can do with, with uh, his or her code is to just crash itself. That's it. They, they can't break out. Um, if you want to read about how that works, there's a thing called suffer fault isolation. That's the, that's the, uh, the core concept in NACL, the native client. Uh, you can read about that. Um, this, this means that you can embed it in data stores like OpenStack Swift. Um, and we've done this up today. It works already. Um, we're still developing it to add some more cool features. So um, the cool thing about this is that you can send code to the data, do computations in place. Um, and you have lots and lots of tiny little processes that live for just a few seconds, and then they're discarded and never reused. Uh, if you want to program on this thing, you can write in C or C++. Um, we've also ported C Python uh, 2.7. We're working on Python 3. And uh, we also support Lua for, for some reason. Um, why is this interesting to Python people? Well, most of our developer tools are written in Python, um, testing tools, and of course the the thing that enables this um, uh, the, the glue between Swift and Zero VM is this Zero Cloud thing, and that's written in Python, of course. Um, everything is Apache two; it's all open source, so use it, contribute to it. And uh, if you want to uh, want to find out more about Zero VM. Uh, check out these websites, come harass us on IRC, or um, harass that Twitter handle right there. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Oh, and if you, if you, oh. Another just gentle reminder, your phones have other settings than Ring. Klaus Bremer, you're up next. All right, I see you. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, my name is Dimitri Jemerov. I work for Google, and I'm here to talk about zombies and application frameworks. So, first of all, why zombies? Let's get, out, get this out of the way first. So, some guys a few years ago wrote a scientific paper on modeling uh, an outbreak of a zombie infection. And the math involved there involves solving as like a system of differential equations. And the SciPy guys actually made a cook cookbook sample out of this. And what I did with this was deploy this to Google App Engine. So just to show that it actually works, so here's my little website. I can just change some values, uh, birth rate, press the simulate button. <clears throat> and provided that my network connection is doing fine, it will show me the updated graph. I'm actually using my personal hotspot on the phone. Yep, so it works. Uh, but wait, this is an App Engine application. How could I deploy SciPy and Matplotlib to App Engine? This doesn't work. Actually, uh, what I used here was a, a new feature of App Engine, which is called Manage VMs. And here's a link to some documentation of it. And what is essentially what this allows me to do is to run the App Engine uh, runtime on the standard Google Compute Engine VMs which means that I still get to use most of the App Engine uh, APIs that are familiar, like the data store, memcache, authentication. And in, in addition to that, I get to do a lot of stuff that wasn't previously possible, such as running background threads and processes, inst installing like binary models, which I just did. I can have direct network and disk access, and I can even, with some caveats, direct the SSH into the machine running on the App Engine instance. Uh, 
and I also get the compute engine pricing. So unlike uh, App Engine compute engine, uh, so unlike App Engine instances, uh, compute engine VMs do not really start in like milliseconds; they start in minutes. So I actually have a long running VM, and I have to pay to keep it running. Uh, but still, there is the, the pricing still is relatively nice. Uh, so how can this actually be accomplished? So in in my app.yaml file. In addition to the standard like App Engine stuff that I usually have there, I add this key parameter, which is called VM equals VM colon true. This means that I want to use this uh, new managed VM stuff. When I do that, I also have to set up to tell which kind of instances I want and how many of them. So in this case, I'm, set, I'm still telling that I want manual scaling. I just want one instance. And here, I specify the type of the instance that I want to use. So like N1 standard one is just some it has one core, it has some amount of memory, just the default compute engine instance. And this wonderful apt get install line allows me to actually install binary packages onto my machine as, uh, as it's installed. And I want to install NumPy, SciPy, and the matplotlib package. Uh, and uh, now, once I have done that, I can actually go into the Google Developers Console and check the state of my instance. So, I, I see, so this is my instance. I can see its state, I can see its IP address, and I can even press the SSH button to connect into it. And I think I have an SSH window already open. No, I don't, so let me open this again. And so this connects direct to, the, to the machine directly from my browser without any native, uh, without any Chrome apps, without any native code, without any plugins. It's just, it just a complete in-browser implementation of the SSH. And, once, uh, and now that I have got there, I can actually, for example, get the list of processes and peek a little bit under the hood, so what's actually running there, like there is like all, kind, all kinds of interesting Google stuff running there, and for example, you can see Docker there, and you can see through that that my application was actually deployed as a Docker image. So this feature is actually now in limited preview, so if you want to use it for your own stuff, you have to sign up for the, uh, for the limited preview, so here's the link where you can do that. And if you have any more questions on this, then you can find me, I'll be around during the rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone. Larry Hastings. All right, he would be next. Great. Yes, my name is Klaus Bremer, and I like to talk about the AVM Fritz box today. The box is uh, a very popular internet access router here, at least in Germany. And what you see here is a picture of an older model, but that doesn't matter. Some time ago, I have tried to um, access this box by means of Python, but unfortunately, I was not able to find any library that allowed that. And so I decided to write my own one. And I've named it Fritz Connection. And before you can talk to this box, you first have to know how this box talks to you. And this is based on UPnP and Ristal. And by the latter one, which is an XML-based dialect, the box tells you about their own API. And once you know this, you can start to exchange data by means of SOAP via HTTP. And the API itself is uh, organized in services. Every service has a lot of action. And any action may get some parameters and may return a result that depends on the action. Yes, to work with Fritz Connection, you first have to install it. That goes by pip install Fritz Connection. And then you have, may have to wait some time because it depends on requests and LXML. And LXML might, might have to compile, so this can take a few minutes. But afterwards, you are able to inspect the API. So this is just a two-liner. You say import Fritz Connection as FC, FC to make a long word short, 
and then you say FC print API, you get the, you offer the, no, you send the address of your Fritz box, the IP address, but that's not, uh, that's optional because uh, Fritz connection knows how to find your box. But you may have changed the IP or may have more than one Fritz box in your network. And then you give your password and as a result, you get a very, very long list of all available services and corresponding action names and the parameters for the actions as tuples here. The first item in this tuple is the name of the parameter, the second one, whether it's inbound or outbound, and the last one, the type of the parameter. Once you know this, you can start to use the API this is done by the method call action, and call action needs the service name, the action name, and optional some parameters. And here's a very simple example. You can say call action one IP connection and force termination as action name. Then the box will reconnect, and you may get a new external IP from your service provider. And because it's hard to remember all the service names and action names, you can wrap it, and here is a shorter call. You can just call FC, reconnect, and it's done. There are more complicated examples. For example, this. There's a module named Fritz Host, which lists you all active hosts, which are connected to the box. This is a snapshot from my own home office, as you can see. And because this is a lightning talk, I see <laughs> there is a repository for it, and there are all a lot of links there to the documentation of the available service names and action names, and you can have a look at the code. And if you say, well, this code is quite ugly and I can do it better, so please feel free to improve it. In this sense, thank you very much. Okay, exercise. Pick up your phone. <laughs> Unlock it. Check the icon that says whether it's on sound, ring, vibrate, or silent. Make sure it's either vibration or silent. We are having currently one ring per lightning talk. I think we can get the ratio down a little bit. Thank you. Oh, there it goes. Hey, it is. You good? Yeah. Ready? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Larry Hastings. I was the release manager for Python 3.4, and I'm probably going to do it again for 3.5. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about how CPython works internally and show you a problem that we were having and how we solved it with a new tool. And by we, I kind of mean me. I did most of this. So let's talk about the problem. Here we have a Python interpreter, and it's running your wonderful code, and you just happen to call os.dupe2, and you pass in uh, two handles, which are actually Python integers. So this goes into the C Python interpreter, and it whirls round and around and around. It comes out here. This is posix underscore dupe2. This is a C function that is the implementation of dupe2 for C Python. Now, how does this work? And specifically, how do we turn those Python objects, which are H and H2, these Python integers, how do we turn them into native C integers, which is what the C code really wants to talk to? So here's POSIX do2. This is sort of the external stuff. There's the doc string, which is a C string, and there's the uh, external interface for do2. Uh, most of it is kind of interesting. It returns a pi object star. Everything that is an object in C Python is a pi object star. Um, it takes in a module, and here it takes the args and kw args. And this is the interesting part, or at least for this talk. Uh, args is a pointer to a tuple, and that contains the positional arguments. kw args is a pointer to a dict, and that contains the uh, keyword arguments, if there are any. 
But these are still Python uh, values. How do we turn them into native C values, which is what we want to deal with? This is it. You actually, it's, it's up to you to write this code. And so there's code that looks a lot like this all over the place in C Python. Um, every time that you want to deal with a parameter, you kind of have to write it in a bunch of different places. So in Python 3.4, we added this new inheritable parameter to dupe2, and we had to touch four different places. Um, we had to add it to this keywords list so that it knew its name for a keyword parameter. We had to actually declare the variable. We had to tell it what type it was. This little i means it's an integer, and the pipe means it's optional. And um, this inheritable, that's how it actually writes it in. We actually had to touch it five different places, but we forgot one. We forgot to touch the doc string. And the reason I point this out is because we're now up to five different places you have to touch when you add a new parameter, and it's kind of an error-prone process. So we were talking about adding a sixth one um, to get introspection information. Right now, if you call inspect.signature on os.dupe2, you don't get a signature back. We wanted to fix that, but that would mean adding a sixth place, and now this seemed like it was going to be way too much work. It was going to be way too error-prone to manage all of these things. So I wrote a new tool. It's called Argument Clinic. Um, the way this works is you write a comment inside of your C file. It's literally a C comment um, with these extra funny strings at the beginning and the end. And inside of that, this is machine-readable information um, formatted, sort of vaguely Python-esque, kind of. Um, it's not intended to look like Python. It's intended to be convenient for the person who's writing it. So you declare the name of your function, you declare your arguments, and you only have to write them once. Um, here you're declaring the arguments, you're declaring uh, their default values, um, you're declaring their C types, and you're declaring um, per argument doc strings, um, which is just a convention for encouraging people to document more, really. And then at the bottom, you have the actual doc string for the entire function. This is input to clinic. Clinic runs over the code, finds this, and then writes immediately afterwards in the C file its output. Its output is C code. Um, this is similar to a tool, by the way, called COG, written by Ned Batchelder, which is a brilliant idea. So this is C code um, that's dealing with uh, inf informing Python about dupe2. So there's the doc string, um, and that's actually, by the way, where we hid the introspection information. It's that funny-looking first line. Um, here is a method def, which is how we tell Python, here's a function called dupe2, here's the function you should call when you call it. This is the external implementation of dupe2, and argument clinic writes that, and that has all of the argument parsing stuff, and it writes a new function for you, you write in the middle, um, called dupe2impl, um, and you'll note, fd, fd2, and inheritable, it's done all the conversion for you, it's now in lovely native C types, and your code becomes much cleaner to read inside of C Python. All this upper code, this stuff, is actually hidden in a separate file, so you don't even see it anymore. Um, that's about all I got. If you want to know more about it, you can read the PEP, PEP 436, or you can look at the source code. Uh, it ships with Python, toolsclinicclinic.py, and it's only about 4,000 lines. Thanks very much. The next one after Sebastian will be Stefan Schwarzer. Are you there? All right, I can see him. Thanks. No, it seems it's not working. Let's try it from here. Hi everyone, I'm Sebastian Kreff, and today I'm going to talk about PEP473, uh, adding structured data to built-in exceptions. It's a draft PEP, so if you like the idea or you have any comments, please like contact me. Uh, I ha start like thinking about this uh, when I was uh, working on doing TDD on a huge code base, and either because like I I was lacking like some understanding of the code or like typos, like I, some tests would fail, and the error messages are like not helpful at all. So the the worst example is index error. So you don't get back either the offending index nor the size of the container. And it's even worse when you have a nested indexing because you, you don't even have the offset. And 
So I started with a, a really hacky solution. I instrument the bytecode uh, to temporarily store some additional information about the, the, the index and the, the receiving objects, and which is open source, by the way. And then uh, I have a test runner that collects all this information and output it like nicely. So in this case, it's kind of like ma much more direct to see that we have an off by one error. And so we can go and fix the code without having to, to debug it or like add extra print statements or whatever method you like. And of course, the limitations of this is not portable. It only works with uh, C Python 2 and also relies on the error messages which are like not standard within the, the standard um, library itself. So I decided to reach the community. I, I wrote to uh, Python Ideas and they were really supportive and they, they point me to some pre-existing issues uh, related to this, like some, some of those are like older than 10 years old. And basically this pep, what it is, it's a summary of all the attempts of like all these people, including Widow, uh, trying to have like more useful, um, more useful uh, exceptions. So for the case of index error, we, we would like add like the target, the index, which is just an alias of the key. And for example, for value error, we, we could have like the unexpected value. So then like test runners could like get this information and, and try to like do some automated debugging for you. The same could be, uh, could be possible in an interactive console like IPython or like for diagnosing uh, failing requests in a web application or long running processes. And in the long term, uh, the idea is like with this information to provide a uniform and normalized uh, error message for all the standard library. So if you, if you find this interesting and want to see it implemented or have any comments, go read the pep and send me an email. A small announcement, um, the local Bitcoin group, um, they are having their opening ceremony for their new office tonight um, at 6.30 um, in their office, obviously. Um, go to their booth and uh, check out the details if you want to go there. Okay. The next after Stefan will be Mark Shannon. Mark, are you around? Excellent. So, uh, my name is Stefan Schwarzer. I'm giving a talk uh, on Thursday uh, about supporting Python 2 and 3 with the same code. And uh, I got a few questions on this uh, yesterday, um, yeah, what this is about, and, and I thought I uh, might say a few words um, about this or who, uh, for whom this is, uh, yeah, this is for. Uh, the talk is intended for developers maintaining a library for Python 2 and your users asking you all the time, please add Python 3 support. We need Python 3, really, we do. Okay, uh, but you are a bit reluctant maybe and don't know how much work this will be. And uh, of course, there's this variant, you are the user and you're waiting for someone else to uh, port this library or adapt the library for Python 3. Um, okay. Uh, the talk is not about uh, all the differences, uh, big and small differences between Python 2 and 3. Uh, there are other documents which summarize this quite nicely. One is, of course, what's new in Python 3 or 3.0, actually. And uh, one, uh, another one is uh, porting to Python 3 or something. Uh, very good guide. Uh, the talk is about some differences between Python 2 and 3, mostly related to uh, Python versus uh, bytes versus Unicode uh, issues, because this is, uh, I think, the most complex part, uh, which might require real thought, I mean, which is not so straight, straightforward to get right. Um, okay, I discussed some steps to, ta uh, to take to get to, to a Python 3 version of your library or the Python 2 code, so it runs on both Python uh, 2 and 3 unchanged. And uh, also some yeah, design, API design uh, advice, 
how, we, how you can do this and some other useful tips or best practices. Yeah. Uh, I also want to uh, give a sprint or offer a sprint on Saturday at least and possibly Sunday. I don't know uh, how much of Sunday I will be here still. Uh, so if you have a library that you want to port uh, or adapt for Python 3, again, with the same source code for Python 2 and 3, uh, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks. I think my, my counter ran out of power. <laughs> okay. I have no slides, it doesn't matter. Just okay. Uh, this talk's called Birthday, and you'll see why in a second. Right, well, Europython's really good, and it's even better if it's your birthday. Hands up if it's your birthday this week. Just me? Oh, no, I see some other people. Good. In fact, it's my birthday today. This is not just an attempt to get free cake and beer. There is some other logic there. <laughs> anyway. Right, well, a birthday is just a number. It's so a number between 1 and 366. So it's just an arbitrary function mapping a person to some small number. It's a, it's a hash function. It's an eight and a half bit hash function. So, uh, right, who's heard of the birthday paradox? A uh, good number, most of you. Okay, for those who haven't. Um, hands up again whose birthday it was this week. No, actually, whose, whose birthday is it today? So, I can't see from here. Well, somebody must have their hand up. There's got to be like at least 300 people. Okay, well, that's good. So, so that's quite a good hash function. It tends to be, you know, not too many collisions. But the problem is, uh, if you take a group of people and see if you find a more than half, the problem is you have more than half of them having the same birthday, you only need 23 people for that to be the case. So that's your birthday paradox, not really a paradox. So you might think you've got quite a good hash function, but chance of collisions is slightly different. In fact, if you've got an n-bit hash function, if you get close to uh, 2 to the n over 2 items, you're likely to have a collision. So if you've got a hash function of 20 bits, which gives you a million items, if you have 1,000 entries, good chance you'll have a collision. You know, a whole number of percent. OK. So hash functions are useful for chopping stuff up into data, but they're sort of probabilistic. So who's heard of bloom filters? I'm not preaching to the converter too much, but definitely a fair bit. OK, so it's a probabilistic set. It's a way of using a hash function to say, is this a member of some set? And what it gives us two, a nice property that we never get any false negatives, but we might have false positives. So if we're going to do a bloom filter based on using birthdays as a hash, um, we'd use 366 bits. But let's suppose we haven't got a big, expensive server that has 366 bits of memory. But we've got this little laptop with 43 bits of memory. So what we can do is we can break the hash up into different hashes, smaller hashes, and save a bit of memory there. Uh, by the way, if anyone actually does know how bloom filters work, they're probably wincing, and I suggest you go and look at Wikipedia afterwards. But this is kind of a fun, fun introduction. So I need two volunteers from the front row. Come on, don't be shy. It's one. Come on, I had to stand up here. All you have to do is put your hand up. OK, we've got two people, right. Can I have your name? You are. You are? J-O-A-R. J-O-A-R. Which is pronounced? You are. And the day of your birth? 24th. 24th. And the month? 10. And sorry, there's a gentleman over there. Peter? Dimitri. I can't hear very well up here, obviously. Dimitri and 24th. This is not working well. Of October. <laughs> and yours was? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Probabilistic data structures for you. Can I have another volunteer just to make this thing work a little bit better? Another volunteer, please. <laughs> OK, sorry. Yes, please. Luis. And hopefully you're not born on 24th of October. 12th of December. Is that, sorry? 12-12. OK. So 
We have our bloom filter, and we're looking for, you are, or Louis, uh, yeah, Louis, sorry, not Dimitri, because we've just scratched Dimitri because he had the wrong birthday. <laughs> um, so we have our bloom filter, and basically what we want to do is we can say probabilistically somebody's probably either you are or Lewis. We can't say for sure that they are, but we can say they're surely if they're not. So I want everyone in the front. If you can see the microphone without turning your, a microphone without turning your head, you're at the front. If you can see a microphone, you're at the back. I want everyone at the front to raise your left hand if your date of birth was the 24th or the 12th. Come on, don't be shy. This doesn't work if you're shy. Really? There's like two or three people there. You're out of time, actually. Oh, well. <laughs> Thomas Weidmann, du bist dran. Thomas. Okay, uh, I just wanted to show you um, two rather new projects. Uh, the one is uh, nsupdate.info and the other is tasty. <laughs> And the special thing is, uh, both were initially written in 48 hours. It was a contest, and it happened at a Stuttgart hackerspace called Checkspace. And I start with NS Update Info. You maybe have used a dynamic DNS service like NoIP or DynDNS or some of the others, but uh, usually they want to sell you something, and only some features are for free, and other features are for pay. And also it's sometimes a bit difficult to find the free features because they have lots of features. And we just thought we write a new one that's much simpler. Uh, on this new service, it's made with uh, Django, by the way. Uh, you can have one account, but you can have many hosts, so you don't need to create a new account for every host. It helps you configure your router. Uh, you even have a small browser-based update client. If you have no other update client, this is for ad hoc usage. Uh, you can update hosts in your own domain if you run your own name server. And you can even update other services that are based on the dynamic DNS uh, protocol. And it supports IPv6 also, and it uses SSL, of course. So it's on GitHub. NS update minus info is the organization. It's BSD licensed, Python, Django, Bootstrap, jQuery, and a library called DNS Python that does all the low level DNS stuff. You can run your own instance on your own server. You need the software, a web server, whiskey, a name server, and a, a database server. But you can even use SQLite 3, so no big data, so, uh, no big database needed. Um, I maybe show shortly a few pictures. Looks like this. If you are not logged in, it shows your IP. If you have IPv6 connectivity, it also shows the IPv6 address. This is the login screen. You have a local account, or you can also log in with GitHub or Bitbucket or Google. This is if you have created a few hosts. On the left, you can create a new host. It's just typing in some name, selecting a domain. It also shows your reverse DNS. This happens after you created a host. It shows you a ready-to-use DD client conf. You just copy and paste this piece of text into the config, and it immediately works. So creating a new host is about two minutes, maybe. This look is the screen if you edit a host. You can change the IP and so on. And you can add new domains if you control a domain name server. And if you add a new domain, it even shows you your bind9 config. If you copy and paste this to your bind installation, it also will immediately work and accept updates. 
statistics, and there is even documentation. It's on GitHub, have a look. The other project is a paste bin. Oops. Ah, fuck. Um, there are lots of paste bins. Usually you just paste text into them. Uh, we wanted to create a new one that accepts every content type. So you can paste uh, PDFs or upload PDFs. You can upload images, video, audio, binaries. If it's text, it, you get highlighting as usual. If it's other content, you get just the appropriate rendering if possible. You can drag and drop multiple files. If you have a modern browser, you get file lists if you drag and drop multiple stuff. There's a simple permission system in it, and it can even deal with large files efficiently. It's also on GitHub. It's called bpasty. It's BSD license, Python, Flask, Bootstrap, jQuery, and so on. And in general, we need your help if such a project is interesting for you. It's good for newbies also. It's rather small projects. Just join us, contribute your ideas, bug fixes, security reviews. You find me on Twitter, and I'm also here for the sprints. Okay, thank you. Christian Heimes, are you around? All right, excellent. And after Christian, um, there's going to be Rock. Rock, did I see you? All right, excellent. Oh, this is a um, display configuration. I think I'm using the other display. Oh, no. Hmm. Doesn't start. Oh, it starts on the wrong display. I uh, have this problem. Hmm. Okay, let's try it this way. Doesn't switch over. Wanna start? Okay. So, hi, I'm Christian Heimers. I'm a yeah, professional paranoid Python core committer. I'm one of the guys that takes care of the security of uh, CPython. So, if you want to know more, you can reach me on Twitter or on email. So, I'd like to talk to you what we'll actually do at the. Uh, so, you know, today I'd like to talk to you what we actually do with C Python core security. We have a Python security response team. That's a team that interacts with all incoming bug reports. We work rather closely with Red Hat and Google, and also with core developers from other teams. Uh, for example, at one time we had an issue that was uh, first detected by Ruby guys. Um, later, I ported the security fix for Python uh, to PHP, so we got, were able to fix the issue on all three projects. Also, we are using a tool called Coverti Scan. It's a commercial tool, but free for open source. It's a static C code analyzer. Uh, with this URL, you can find uh, C Python. Um, yeah, Coverti defined this limit defect to send. Uh, density for uh, different kinds of projects and size. So for Python, it would be about .5. But actually today it's, so we just have two outstanding issues because I updated the tool chain to a new version and detected two more issues. I hope to close that in a couple of days. So we got some new things. I implemented this pep. It uh, replaces the old uh, hash function used for dictionaries. And so the thing that hashes the strings and Unicode strings uh, to a hash. 
uh, with Zipesh24 from DJ Bernstein. And another guy implemented uh, this pep. It's basically, it ensures that file descriptors doesn't get leaked to sub-processes. It's especially important if you have a root daemon that starts some other processes that are, um, right, that should not get sensitive information. Uh, that's the isolated mode, a, a new feature too, uh, that does something so uh, console script doesn't get poisoned by the user site directory or some NFARS. Uh, OS uranum got a bit optimized for Python 3.4, it uses a persistent file descriptor. Eventually we're going to use the new shiny get random syscall Linux getting these days. On Windows, we're using this function. Oh, and by the way, you're using, uh, you want to have any random secure uh, random numbers, don't ever use the random module. It's use a Mazana twister, and if an attacker is able to get this amount of uh, outputs, uh, it can guess any future outputs. It's 624, so not much. Um, this is another feature I implemented for Python 3.4. Uh, it's a password-based uh, key, der key derivation function too. Um, while I was implementing this, I found a DOS vulnerability in OpenSSL in their implementation. Uh, by the way, the same issue Django had a while ago. So, and if you're dealing with passwords, never ever use anything else than these three functions. Bcrypt and Scrypt are fine too. And if you need this function in Python 2 or all the versions, please use my library because it's much, much faster than any other libraries currently on the market. So there's also some changes in the HMAC module with Python 3.3. We already had uh, this compute digest comparison function. Python 3.3, 3.4, we're getting another one. And the good thing is, uh, so, oh, we're almost out of time. So skipping to the end, several of these features will be backported to Python 2.7. So really new features, except for security. So. After Rock, the last uh, slot will be for, that's one name I really don't know how to pronounce. Gior, exactly, you're next. Should be not there. Huh? I, it's, it's, it's okay. okay. Yeah, it's gonna work, cool. Hi guys, uh, I'm Rock, I work for Road Code, um, and as any of you, you I install my software, uh, and as a developer, I install it even more often. I have more multiple versions, different project, different platform, not only Python. Um, therefore, I usually broke my system. Um, not anymore, since I switched to Nix. Uh, Nix is a package manager. You heard the talk this morning from my uh, uh, friend Dolman about it, the internals. Uh, I would just like to go through all the features it offers and invite you uh, at the end um, of the Europe Python to join us to Sprint and uh, make sure you don't break your system uh, by just developing on your project. Um, so Nix, uh, it's, let's start in the top bo bottom, it's portable, it works on any POSIX uh, platform, which means um, Poor macOS users could actually now drop, uh, uh, go away from homebrew, because uh, we ship also binaries. Um, uh, so yeah, we have a transparent source uh, binary model. Uh, so if it's, the binaries are not found, yes, we'll compile them for you if it's needed. Uh, we, uh, we support multi-user and multi-version uh, uh, solution to the problem, so you can work, uh, you can have uh, different Python versions uh, installed at the same time in the same environment, uh, and they do not conflict. Um, going up, uh, we make sure that every installation you do, it's reliable, and it doesn't break anything outside of that installation. 
even though even sometimes happen that some installation break, all the installations are atomic. Uh, and if something goes wrong, if the installation is in, um, installed, application is installed successfully, you can always roll back to previous version. Um, it's reproducible. Uh, the thing that bugs me the most is when somebody does a false release on PyPy uh, and uh, somebody forgot to pin uh, the versions that, that I'm developing. At one point, I end up with a broken uh, development environment. Uh, we make sure here, with by default, you get the, it's always working once you set it up. Um, and well, all in all, Nix is great for developers. Uh, think of Nix as a virtual env, the tool you probably are all using, but much bigger. It's not only meant for Python. It's you can you use it for any project, um, any language specific project you have. You can even uh, bind them more together because. I think nowadays uh, we are all kind of forced at least to, um, to learn JavaScript and all the tool stack they have. So uh, it's one tool to do the job. And uh, just to maybe, because you're probably wondering, yeah, this is a tool that looks, again, like Docker, right? Uh, we don't virtualize anything. Uh, we think a packaging problem should be done by the, uh, on the packaging level. Uh, we can output, we can provision, or whatever you want to call it, Docker, VirtualBox, um, any images. Uh, but you can just use it for booting, bootstrapping your development environment and not screwing up your laptop. Uh, thank you, uh, and hope to see you uh, on Saturday. We'll have a Nick's Corner, and we can get you up and running uh, for basically any uh, development environment you need. Thank you. SUR will be the uh, last one. And as we have been talking about sprints uh, a couple of times already, who of you is thinking about joining us on the sprints on Saturday? Can you show me you your much. hands? Mm. That is a good number. That is awesome. It looks like, I would guess, at least 50, 60 in here. That's very nice. All right. My name is uh, UR. And uh, I came to a realization yesterday that uh, set up Pi, the dependency declaration for your program basically, is Turing complete. So I exploited that fact and uh, I created a package called uh, Deproulette. You never know what you get. So pip install Deproulette and uh, then it, don't do it. <laughs> Just don't, that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was fast. <laughs> You've got the shortest lightning talk. Awesome. It's 45 seconds.